All right, we are live. Uh, welcome everybody to Novel Technologies for Behavior Change Design. Um, we'll be going uh, for um, the next, uh, I guess, hour or so. Um, we've got uh, th three sets of speakers here today, and we're all going to talk about um, uh, different ways by which uh, folks have been using uh, novel technologies to design for behavior change, right? So, so when we think about designing for behavior change, we spend a good deal of time understanding the people, the context, the behaviors we're looking to help people change. And we often think about how we can do this through you know, different uses of technologies. How do we deliver content, behavior change techniques, um, things that are tailored to the specific needs and characteristics of an individual. One of those tools that offers us the ability to do that uh, is data uh, and being able to use data to um, shape, sequence, tailor, customize the support we give people in um, helping them to change, uh, change those behaviors. And whether or not we deliver that or use it and deliver it through chatbots, virtual agents, personalized biometric feedback, um, or light up um, wall holds in a, in a climbing gym, um, we can take advantage of these things to make better experiences, be more effective in our ability to uh, change behavior and, uh, and improve health. And, and that's where our talks are focused today, which is, I think, a really exciting and, and timely theme. Um, definitely post questions in the q and I'll follow along with those and um, we'll get those in front of our, our panelists as well. And with that, we've got Ravi here. I will... Uh, I will introduce uh, Ravi. Um, he is the, the founder and CEO of Motive Health, uh, which is focused on uh, human and AI coaches for health behavior change. Um, he's previously co-founded Lumiata, which is a big data and AI company, and also Reflection Health, uh, which was a, is a really innovative uh, avatar-led home physical therapy solution. And today he's going to talk to us about digital charisma, uh, or health bots with personality. So I'll turn it over to you, Ravi, and uh, excited to hear uh, what you've got. Thanks, Dustin. And everybody watching and listening, uh, appreciate taking the time. Let me share my screen here and we'll get started. So I wanted to talk about something that I call digital charisma. And the reason I brought this topic up is because I think that persuasion really requires personality. And if I had to make that even shorter, I'd just say, Make bots with attitudes because it matters. And I'll show you why. So if you're in this room already, we already know this stuff, but I thought I'd put it up just to be sure that all these things on the screen that you're seeing are diseases that are all preventable and they're all treatable. And a lot of these are reversible. So we know the treatment is behaviors. Um, but you know, the interesting thing about health behavior is that although it's sometimes the, considered the holy grail of healthcare and medicine, something very difficult. I honestly don't think it is. It's in our nature. This is what we do as humans, right? Neuroplasticity is one of the great adaptations of the human brain and the human species. And it's what al allows us to be able to thrive in like the Sahara and also thrive in the Arctic, right? Humans adapt. This is something that we do and we do well. So in some sense, I just want to offer a little bit of a respite from the incredible challenge on our shoulders of saying behavior change is hard. It's not that hard. It's really simple. Here's what you do. You live with the Navy SEAL. I can guarantee you living with the Navy SEAL will change your behavior. You will be better and healthier uh, in three months. If, you, uh, if anyone here has ever read this book, it's absolutely hilarious to see Jesse Itzler. He's the um, husband of the Spanx founder and hired David Goggins, actually Goggins did it for free, to come live with him. And the stories he tells are just amazing. But what he got him to do in terms of reaching his potential was pretty amazing. You know, if you don't want to live with a Navy SEAL, hire Bob Green. This is Oprah's personal trainer. Um, if these two examples seem ridiculous, they are ridiculous because we're not all, you know, uh, queens of daytime TV with billion dollar bank accounts. But these are proven strategies to get your health behaviors improved, right? So when you think about it, in some sense, it's not that we don't know the, the ways to improve people's health behaviors. It's just that it suffers from a very specific problem, which is it can't scale. We're really bad at scaling it. And that's a real problem. 
Uh, I call it the superhero scaling problem. It's the same thing. It's the problem that doctors and healthcare professionals fundamentally have. It's the same problem that Marvel superheroes have. You can have as much superpower as you want, but the problem is you can't be everywhere at once, right? So this is, and this is a real problem. I mean, given the physician shortage looming, not the physicians are the end all be all behavior change, but we have a, we have a gap here that we really have to address. Diseases are getting worse. The, the population of people with these chronic conditions is getting worse, and we're not going to be able to ever train enough coaches or physicians to, to, to meet that gap. So this is AI to the rescue, right? This is the, the grand solution that we at some level. And in, again, the, the good news here is that we're already surrounding ourselves with digital solutions that know how to be very persuasive. Amazon gets me to buy things I don't know I needed. Spotify lets me know about songs I didn't know I liked. And Netflix makes me watch things called Bridgerton, which along with Netflix's AI and my wife seems to me to be something like porn with a story. I don't know if you all watch this, but that's what it seems, seems to be. In any case, we kind of know how to do it, right? And this is where we can start bringing in things like bots and conversational agents to be persuasive to people in terms of health coaching. And it's not so crazy because in some sense, we've been talking to machines as a species for a long time, right? But for the first time in a long time, our machines are talking back. Um, and the chances are even right now, or today, you've already talked to one, you've been interacting with one through text possibly, or one is listening to you. So these things are everywhere, right? And I think all of us in the field here would, would agree with that, the power of it. And we're talking to them, right? Most people have access to Siri, Alexa, or another smart speaker or smart agent, and people are talking at least once a day to these things. Uh, and we're okay with it, right? Most people agree that they're useful. And we've seen a lot of customer service area as well. People are very comfortable talking to emotional agents. So the potential is clear. Bots can definitely health coaching. The problem is most chatbots are boring. I mean, this is something that I wish wasn't true, but it's true. And I think all of us have had experiences that show this. Most chatbots are boring. And low engagement, we know it's persuasive. So what is it? Like, what is it about human coaches that are so compelling and bots are boring. That's a topic for a whole nother series of conferences probably, but I tried to nail it down into a couple things about what makes a great coach. When you look through the literature, you find some very interesting patterns. There are some very discrete characteristics that make great coaches charismatic. And just some of them are the fact that they are able to access an emotional range or context aware, they have a persona, they have credibility, they walk the walk, they have patience, but they also instill a sense of urgency. Um, and they have a look and feel about them that's very charismatic. And they have complex conversations and are able to adapt their styles to the individual person they're coaching. Um, you know, in some sense, they can feel like they're on with you when you're being coached. They need to be, they can be your sparring partner. Right? It's like that matrix when he went to go see the oracle and he was asked well what did she say and it was like exactly what you needed to hear is what she said right in some sense that's the the magic of having a coach that knows you really well and compared to humans and the stuff that's happening in that mental calculation it just doesn't seem like the bots are there yet right despite what we've seen in in our fictional universes we're just not there it's almost like be working with a full deck of crayon, a set of crayons, and the bots are just missing a couple. I want to talk about digital charisma, which is how do we instill some of those things that make great coaches into our uh, our companions? Because the the potential here is huge, not only for to scale, but also if you think about it, this is the first time in history we've been able to engineer our own colleagues and friends in silico. So that's kind of exciting. So I thought of seven categories of things and I'll go through them pretty quickly. Um, one is honesty. So I don't know if um, all of you remember this, but there was a demo with Google and Google Duplex where they had the system live on stage, create a hair, a, appointment at a hairstyle. So I'm kind of fundamentally opposed to this. This seems to be a bad idea because when you, coaching and behavior change fundamentally relies on trust. 
And when you erode that trust, you get contempt for your product. And contempt is below treachery on the 10th level of Dante's Inferno of hell. So try to avoid contempt at all costs. There's something that just doesn't feel right about this, and nor is it necessary. So absolute honesty, although Tars says this from Interstellar, I think we should relearn really from the HAL 9000 thing. Don't make people not trust the conversation that's coming from your design product, right? And you know, as much as I hate to say it, you know, the Turing test, much like Alan Turing, is dead. You don't need to prove or convince people or fool them that your bot is not human. They get it and they'll still, it's, it still will make a difference. And the reason is because of the look and feel, right? The look and feel actually matters. Um, and, it's, and it has to do with humanness and anthropomorphism, right? We know this intuitively. We assign psychological traits to things that are machines and it matters how much they look and act like humans. Um, and it doesn't have to exactly match humans. It just has to act like, which in this case, for example, in gambling, when they found that they did this with slot machine, but it happens, but you could also use it the other way to increase trust in things like autonomous vehicles. So anthropomorphism, the look and feel is, is really important. And it's important in healthcare with physical objects. We see it in our fictional universes. We also see it in robots. The robot in the lower right is, is, is Mabu from um, uh, Corey Kidd's company, Katalia Health, which is really impressive. They're deploying this into elder people's homes and it serves as a very useful health companion uh, for people who are lonely and it's been very effective. And it's not just physical manifestations, but even things like icons. You can see that how, how people determine credibility and trust in just the icon that's chosen to represent a conversational agent or yourself. So the quick lesson here, put a face on it. It's a good place to start. Put a non-creepy face on it, but you can try putting a face on it. Um, the third is actually a very good news. Knowledge and credibility is important, but the good news here is that we're doing quite a good job of this. As information retrieval systems, our AI companions are really good at this, right? This is something that is, is, is going to be even better. Um, the fourth is sensing and context. If you want to synthesize emotions in a conversation, you need to be able to sense them correctly, right? Um, and we use lots of variables to determine context and intent. Um, each, each one of us does, and especially health coaches and people trained to change behavior in the healthcare domain. Um, and smartphones can do some of this lifting. We already know the suite of sensors that, we're, that we have available to us with our phones. Um, and uh, more and more people are using phones. So I think that's gonna be a better story as we go forward. But you can also just ask people. Motivational interviewing is really important. Being able to code that data uh, is important as well. And there are more standardized ways of doing it with like personality testing and et cetera. So these things exist. And once you start using them, you'll start seeing patterns in what marketers would call psychographic segmentation, right? People start to cluster in how they behave. Um, and this is an example of one case with uh, Alexa, where some people see, older people in general see it as a flatmate, as a partner, whereas younger people see it just as a tool. So interesting patterns emerge, but it's doable. But the most exciting part of this is you can passively sense. And this is kind of the field of affective computing, where there are a bunch of uh, AI tools, or machine learning tools rather, to understand and uh, detect emotional arousal uh, and valence and affect, just using things like video, and there are a bunch of APIs out here. I won't go through all of them, but you, you all get the idea. And they can also just do sentiment analysis. Some parts of this is not new. It's been around for a while, but it's getting better and better. And APIs are more available to more companies and startups and tools. What you want to do is eventually be able to sense at such a high level that you know when to intervene, right? It's, inter it's, the, it's the course correcting somebody as they uh, uh, roll up to the McDonald's drive through and go, yep, we got that. We know you're stressed out. We know you're anxious. We know you've already eaten this much today. Here's what I need to tell you to alter this behavior right now in the moment. Isn't that all, you know, what we're all aiming for? Um, and the fifth is emotion. So affect, valence, arousal, motivation, intensity. I'll go through this really quick. Affect is your general mood. Valence, how moody are you? Is it in the positive or negative in terms of uh, in terms of mood? Arousal, how aroused is that? How intense is that emotion in some sense? And motivational intensity is something a little different. 
it more refers to you could be very aroused, but is it going to get you to do something? Are you going to take an action, which is really relevant for health coaching and, and the things we're doing here? So you already know people are different, but what I want to uh, remind everyone, and if you remember nothing else from this talk, please, this is the most important piece. Behavior depends on emotion. Everyone is different. When I say that, this system, how we think about actions and emotions typically are, we've always thought of separate systems and they're kind of people are very rational or making emotional decisions. This is, this is false, right? These things are intertwined in everything we do. You cannot have a rational thought without it being attached to an affect, a mood. So basically, if you're not trying to manipulate that person's emotional aspect of their thought, you're losing information. You're not taking advantage of the things you could be to make them do something or persuade them to take an action that, you, that would be healthier for them. And this picture kind of shows that. You can see that in, in part two there, it's like, you know, information is processed through both systems to output to an action. And that's what emotions really are. This work was done by Lisa Feldman Barrett, who's going to be rewriting the book on how emotions are made, which is a great, great book. And she has a lot of papers as well. Um, and this is what she was getting at, that these reactions, these moods, these emotions, these thoughts are designed to take action. So we already had a system to do that where emotions are intertwined. So this is why it's so important to put to, to imbue personality into our conversations. Like I said, they're free information, right? Um, and there's always a debate on how many emotions there are. Suffice it to say, Several papers on this have come out with different numbers, but there are upwards of 10 to 15 categories. This paper in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences used video to try to figure out 27 different categories. It was pretty rigorous. So you can see that it's much more than just the eight that we usually use or think about, right? Uh, and you look through this list, you can probably, you're probably thinking about things uh, in your own life that are, that, that, um, are associated with these different emotions. Um, but I think it's somewhat un unwieldy to, uh, to use that list. So what I look at is Plutchik's Wheel of Emotions. This is a way of arranging eight basic emotions and their combinations uh, in a circle and with higher intensity as you go to the center. And when you look at conversations, it can be a great guide to design your conversations with your bot or AI, because you can see where you where someone is on the wheel and where you want them to move on the wheel. So I'll give you some examples. So here's a situation with Replica, which is an incredible, incredible app, um, where they're matching and augmenting the emotions, turning up the volume of what the user is saying. And in the wheel, this would be like going toward the center. So someone's very excited about something and the replica bot is trying to augment that. Say, yeah, it is going to be great. You're going to be great. I'm going to be great. Everyone's happy, right? Which can be very useful. Here's one where you're trying to get someone to take action. This is a case um, which is basically a case that we had at Motive with one of our, uh, several of our clients where sometimes we have to be annoyed at them, right? We have to be a little bit mad at them. We know in the moment that's what's gonna get them to move and maneuver to an improved health behavior based on our baseline data about them. Um, here's an example of a contrasting emotion. You're trying to take someone from um, serenity to annoyance a little bit. You want to get them aroused. And so the bot is doing that, right? So we're going to see you at eight. Okay, see you then. Hey, what happened? You missed the appointment. And this is where you want to escalate to annoyance. Um, but you can do the opposite as well. So for a lot of like mental health apps where you have people with anxiety, you're trying to de-escalate that emotion, right? You can go from fear and surprise, which is a part of anxiety, and you can take them down to anticipation and interest. Um, as well. So this can be a useful guide to do these, these kind of things. So the other thing I want to impress is it's okay to use humor. It's okay to use anger and surprise and even annoyance when they're appropriate. This app did this. Now, the one thing about the Carrot app, when it came out, it was kind of a one-trick pony. It did this all the time. So they got a little bit of trouble because you can imagine that like being annoyed and angry all the time, people and fat shaming them is not a good way to have them lose weight or engage in better health behaviors. But it was an early experiment in this kind of thing. And we know from fiction that we're used to seeing these kind of interactions. So at some level, we're comfortable with them. Um, you know, as Maya Angelou said, I've learned that people forget what you said, people forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. 
So in general, when you start doing these things, the look and feel, the emotional responses, using the wheel of emotions to kind of map these conversations out, what you're really doing is aiming for a persona for your conversational agent or a bot. And these personas can be really important and they can be matched to each individual. We know that um, our coaches in our own life uh, probably fit in one of these personas, our parents, our friends. So we are very familiar and used to personas as human, as human species. And matching personas has been shown to really motivate and improve people's behaviors. Um, and sometimes they're counterintuitive. In this case, Michelle Zhu did a study where they talked about what kind of bot would be good uh, as a trustworthy interviewer. And in this case, it wasn't the gregarious, cheerful, warm, agreeable bot. It was more reserved, calm, and assertive. So aiming for a persona and matching it is very important. And then point seven really has to do with a couple of things with conversational complexity. Things that we already know but are important to mention in this space are empathy. And you know there can't be any other movie than her that really showed the power of empathy and human connection and trust and bonding. What's really interesting about this movie is that you never saw the character, right? Like it was always a voice on a phone. So I thought that was fascinating. And we all know there's different types of empathy, but being aware of cognitive, emotional, and affective empathy and building them into the conversation can be very helpful. Um, and length. Conversational length is something that has always been lacking in bots that we've had so far, but that is uh, rapidly improving. So you can see this in Robot, the mental health apps, Tess, Replica, uh, and as I mentioned before, Mabu, Katalia, Health's bot. I asked Corey once, I said, how long are people talking to your bot? Because you can't really hold a conversation very well with Siri and Alexa. And he said the longest was 48 minutes, which is quite impressive. Um, and we know that for coaching specifically, chatbot-driven uh, lengthy conversations can be can be out. So contextual understanding and memory, again, using sensing to figure out what you want to, to do and giving it to them before they know. So this is the, the great example is Jarvis from Iron Man, where he's like, hey, look, you're, you're headed toward disaster. Um, uh, you know, shall I inform Ms. Potts and let her know you'll be late? Um, and flaws and quirks. So these are important. These, makes, these make things a little personable. So is it better to be right or likable, right? You wanna be more likable than right sometimes, or when you're talking about cancer or something, you wanna be more right than likable. But flaws can make something more human, and they can also help us get around the engineering problems, right? Like the bots are gonna be wrong. Our conversational agents aren't gonna get it right every time. You wanna be likable so you're forgivable. Um, and you know, quirks, like small talk versus little talk. One could argue that one of the things that we're actually missing in our isolation with COVID is not always the, just the small talk, the conversations, it's the little talk. It's the things when you go to the store, the please and thank yous they're used to doing when you're interacting with people. And you can build these things into our agents. So it all works because of, um, you know, this rests on the shoulders of a pretty robust thing called the, the, the media equation, the social actress paradigm. We take shortcuts in our brains and we view these things, these machines, uh, with human characteristics, and we can utilize that to, to help us change behaviors. There's risk to this, right? There's real risk to this, and getting it wrong has consequences. You can lose trust, you can have low engagement, you can tell people the wrong things. Um, there's differences in culture, right? And it has to be adapted to that. There, and one, ex one example is Tay, right, from Microsoft, if you all remember this. It was kind of a failure. It was an experiment in, in, in uh, learning from the internet and Twitter, which is usually a bad idea. <laughs> Um, and there's extremes. On one extreme, the uncanny valley where you get too realistic and people don't like it anymore. And the other extreme, which is happening now, is like people are bringing or dating apps on their Nintendo Switch and marrying them, which is kind of crazy. So there are harms in both. But, in, but just to summarize, so digital charisma matters. And the question is, you know, are you making AI design choices that help create it? And remember that cognition and emotion are intertwined. Take cues from, from human experts. Use sensing. Be honest, use emotional range to drive behavior, and create and match personas. So that is it. Happy to take any questions. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you, Robbie. That was that was great. Um, I've got uh, I've got a question which is which is broad, so feel free. I've got many questions, but to, to feel free to, to bite it off <laughs> as you like. Sure. Um, how do you even, like, how do you start the design process when we think about, um, you know, creating these kinds of conversations? Where do you even, even start? 
Yeah, right. So first of all, there's kind of two ways you can do this. You can do this top down, right? Which you can go, I'm going to engineer these conversations and kind of make these decision trees in our heads. Yeah. So that's very difficult. When you think about how human coaches are trained, there's some clinical acumen that they, they what did they need? They have some clinical background. They have, there's some good ways to do this that you know and that you pass on to others, right? Through like actual didactic training or whatever. And this is where the training comes in. The second is actual experience. So the other way to do this is bottom up, which is to, to just go mine the conversations that really good human coaches do that result in outcomes and, and behavior change. So I think you have to use some kind of combination of both, right? So there's some good practices and best practices that can set our guidelines on what to say and what not to say. Like don't call people stupid idiots, right? It's like a conversation you probably should never want to have, right? Um, but at the same time, it's like, how annoyed do I get, right? It's like what co good coaches do is they rely on that clinical acumen in context, right? So what information are they using to make those decisions? Now, the example I gave where, um, and this actually happened, I, I had a, 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 we had a coaching client who was like, you know, is diabetic and he's not diabetic anymore after, you know, six months of exercise and nutrition. But the point was he came home on like week four and he's like, I'm too tired, man. I just don't want to work out. I'm like, dude, I texted this and I was like, hmm, he's this kind of personality type. He's very competitive, you know? And um, uh, he's an engineer. And so I had all this background information on him. I was like, what kind of message would make this call to action, which is to go and just take a 15 minute walk right now at like 6 p.m. after a hard day of work. And I saw his schedule too. I know his calendar. So I'm like, I know he's like back to back meetings. I was like, dude, you got to man up and make this happen. You just got to make it happen. You got to get the wine, go get your shoes and socks and let's go. Now that's something that you just can't say to everybody. You have to be very careful with that kind of messaging. Although we know that can drive behavior. So I used a variety of things there, you know, been a doctor for 17 years. So I've got some clinical acumen and background. I'm using contextual data to do that. And I'm like, it's, it's an experiment, right? It's a bet. These conversations are like bets. So we, okay, so it's just like, you're trying to go, what's the safest bet to make in this next couple sentences. And sometimes you get that wrong. Right. So I would just say, you know, there's an opportunity here to just take cues from what people are doing already. And if we can um, digitize those experiences correctly, we can use machine learning to start mining those conversations and deconstructing what works. Yeah. Um, do you I didn't I didn't catch it. Is there um, do you have a number of different bot personality types that you've got in play? Like, is it two now? Is it 12? <laughs> Where are you there? We're not, yeah, we're still in the design phase there. We're still, yep. we're still trying to get data from, from our coaches, like what I was saying. So you know, deconstructing those interactions and yeah. annotating them with like, with a taxonomy is kind of what we're, we're in the process of. So it's going to be interesting to see, and this is an open research question. So I'd love comments from everybody else as well. Um, but like, do, how do people cluster when it comes to health behaviors and chronic disease, for example, how many clusters are there? How many personas? How many phenotypes? Because that'll help us determine how many um, coaching phenotypes we need, right? And this is a, this is something I'm I'm very curious yeah. to find out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a there's a question that's popped up um, with a with a ditto here, uh, which is uh, thinking about like how do you how do we, the collective we, uh, work on collaborating um, and developing for different communities um, as they relate to bots, right? How do you get the, yeah. the patient or person perspective in that process? So, you know, one way to do that, and that's a great question, because you saw the example with Tay, you're seeing the example of biases now in AI, because AI is just as good as the, the, the machine learning, as good as the data set, the data set's obviously going to be colored is to be able to describe the data set correctly with some kind of, you know, if we had some kind of coding system for each data set work very quickly, researchers or developers could see, ah, okay, so this was taken in India with 200 million Indians who were rating these videos, which that actually happened, right? For one of these studies doing emotional analysis. So it's like, okay, well, we're not actually determining emotions, we're determining how Indian people determine emotions on Western movies. Okay, that's a different data set. If I had known that from the beginning, um, that would be helpful. So then I know to go get other data sets to even these things out, given my target population. If, you know, as a community, if we could build that kind of transparency without, you know, giving away proprietary information, that'd be really helpful because then we can pick and choose and then we'd know, okay, well, here's the gaps I'm missing. Here's and who's got that, right? And that opens the conversation, at least for us to start sharing information um, to help kind of bring all of us up in this field. Awesome. Yeah. Um, 
you had talked about um, the, you know, the, the duration of sessions, right? And there's a range and we know uh, we may get accustomed to really quick blasts of, you know, AI or chatbot sessions. And then you talked about that 45 minute example. Um, so definitely a, a range there and a volume. Um, when you're thinking or when you're planning around like the between session interactions, like, so, you know, we, I may have a two minute or 20 second interaction. I may have a 45 minute interaction. How do you go about thinking through again, like those, those possibilities of how many sessions does it take, right? The human coaches have a, a rough outline that they react to um, over time. Is it, how different is it when we're thinking about planning for these kinds of um, AI based conversations? Yeah, it's an interesting question, right? So I think it, it, it's different. It, it is and it isn't. It, 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 yeah. It's not different because we can take, again, human cues here. So like whatever, how many interactions or minutes of interactions it take to get a specific call to action. Yeah. Most of the time when we're coaching our team, um, it's not all just these nudges or emotional blackmail sometimes, like the example I gave before. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's just really simple um, empathy and encouragement which I personally thought was cheesy when I first started doing it. Because when you describe to somebody, Dustin, I'm just gonna tell you that you're a good person, you can do this today, sounds stupid. It sounds like you could see through that. When you're on the receiving end of that message, right? It's a very different story, right? So it's like, no, that just took a second to do. I'm not even waiting for a response. If they do, that's great. But it's like, I know that's gonna make an impact. I can see the impact and the outcomes we're measuring every three months or whatever. So I think some of those messages can be really short, but the sure that the anxiety of the user or the question they're having is answered and that may mean taking a couple minutes to answer it so when you, when you ask Corey about this because you know, I was delving into this with him and um, with with Mabu he's like these are older people who have questions and want to talk mm -hmm. they're trying to explore their feelings or their questions aren't answered and that's really important to them so I think get the questions answered yeah or if you can't if your bot can't kick it up to a person who can Awesome. I love it. I, I think this space is so exciting, right? And and I've I've been really interested in watching it develop, right? From the first rounds of like, I don't know, this is it's so great to you know, to where we are now and to where we're headed. Um, I'm a true true believer in the possibilities and, and potentials here. Um, I'm definitely gonna keep my eyes on you. We gotta connect after anyway. Um, so yeah. thank you so much. Um, it's, it was awesome presentation. Uh, thank you. Thanks everybody. Appreciate it. And I'll respond to questions when I get through them. All right. All right. Uh, appreciate it again, Robbie.